All right, Field of Ethos podcast. Uh, Eric Trump, what's up, dude? Jason, what's up, my man? Man, just um, ready to talk some shit about Don. Uh, yes, we're gonna yeah. have, we're gonna we're gonna cover all kinds of things, but we're gonna cover the negative side of Don heavily today. Uh, by the way, and there's no better person in the world than this guy for uh, for that conversation. So, I mean, you've got so. you've got all you've got everything from the younger brother's perspective, which is let's face it. I mean, I'm a younger brother. That's the honest perspective. So, uh, so he's six years older. He grew up literally duct taping me to trees, shooting me with paintball guns, shooting me with slingshots, uh, more blow guns than you can possibly imagine. I had more darts in me. We had these BB gun wars back in the days that were, that were epics. It was, uh, remember the old days, he BB guns, you'd pump the hell out of the things. And so we had this one pump rule, but we get about 10 feet away from one another and you just hear him behind the bush, just pumping the hell out of this BB gun. And, uh, I know we had, uh, we had a lot of good times together, a lot of, a lot of good wars, a lot of bruises. I was normally on the receiving end of it. I don't care how big you are. I'm a lot bigger than Don now, meaning height wise and size wise. But six year difference between you know brothers, you just can't get over. It is six that's year a, old versus that's twelve a year old, a twelve year old and versus an eighteen year old. You just you can't make up that difference. So I, I was definitely on the receiving end of uh, a lot of beating, but it was uh, it was great. He's uh, he's an awesome guy. You know, one of my best friends in the entire world, and. Um, but we will shit on him today. That yes, we will. We will certainly shit on him today. Let's do a quick warm up. Um, just some rapid fire questions. Uh, favorite action movie? Oh, you know, Predator was on this morning. That's and a good one. If Predator's great. Commando's a great movie. Uh, Bloodsport. Bloodsport has to rank up there. A uh, Top Gun was always my all time favorite. But you know, I, if we're going to talk action movies on Field Ethos, that's kind of be you know cheesy. Um, yeah. you know, definitely real, the, cheesy, the Ram, cheesy Rambo three was amazing. You know, when he was in Afghanistan shooting helicopters with, you know, bows and shit, that was, that's up there on my list. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> that was a great scene. Um, so favorite music, favorite band. Oh, I got a big, uh, I'm a big classic rock guy. Uh, Pink Floyd would be up there. Dire Straits. Um, you know, Mark Knopfler, Dire Straits would definitely be kind of top of the list. Yeah. Um, you don't hear that. You, you don't hear much about Dire Straits anymore. Oh, dude, I love Dire Straits. Mark Knopfler with the guitar is an absolute stud. Favorite automobile? You don't have to own it. It's not one that you've never owned. But you're one not a, like a big car guy anyway. But what, like, if you could have one car, what would it be? That's tough. I, I have a '61 Vet. It was, it's my, uh, it was my uh, father-in-law's. That's an awesome car. And literally, that would probably be it. To tell you the truth, just beautiful yeah. kind of all-American classic. You know, early '60s, beautiful lines before they kind of you know cheese them out. Um, you know, that definitely be kind of top of the list. Um, listen, I'm a I'm an SUV guy. I'm a I'm a truck guy. Anywhere I go, I always have either guns in the back of my car. Or I've got gear in the back of my car, so I'm not really the traditional you know the Ferrari behind you on the wall. You know, I'm less of that. You know, I'm, my car is more utilitarian always because it's you know the kind of mental lug gear. Tony so Tony Caggiano tells a funny story about when you were like 16 or 17 and you pulling up in your truck to hunt with him and you had some of those metal truck nuts hanging off the back of your truck. I, I forget. They were plastic truck nuts to be. Plastic to be truck nuts. But they were flesh colored, just so you know. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Realistic. They, 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 were, they were tied on by a little string. And so they swung back and forth as you hit bumps. And, you know, it was very, a very cool 16 year old. But what uh, kind of what kind of truck did you have? I had a Durango. A Durango. Okay, so I, an SUV. Uh, I had a, a Jeep Laredo. Or Don had that car first, and then I had a, uh, I had a blue Dodge Durango. That car was great, other than the fact that, you know, you're in college, you have no money, and you're trying to fill up a 5.7 liter engine that gets about four miles to a gallon. But that, that was a great truck. So, you just mentioned something like you had a Laredo that was Don's first. So you got a hand-me-down vehicle from Don. I, I did. You know, so surprisingly, you probably know this for Don. Our, our parents were. Listen, I'm sitting in Trump Tower right now. I run a big company. You know, we we lived a very, very spoiled life in a certain way. But you know, if 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 we wanted something, we worked our our butt off for it. We worked construction every single summer. I did every bit of electrical, plumbing, HVAC. I mean, I spent more time, you know, when I was 11, 12 years old, with the chainsaw, cutting down trees, running backhoes, and you know, it's if, if we wanted something, we worked for it. We were not the kids who were going to get the Ferrari. Uh, you know, when they turned 16 years old, I just you know, yeah. that wasn't my mom, that wasn't our father. It was you know, very kind of you know, tough love. Again, we had beautiful homes. We had a roof above our head. We always, you know, got great education, best schools. Um, guess what? You want a new fishing rod? You wanted a 22? You wanted a uh, a new BB gun? 
you know, you're going to be sitting there working minimum wage. And you know, Don and I grew up on construction sites. That's what we grew up doing. And it was uh, it's the best thing that's ever happened to us, to tell you the truth. It you know, taught us a, a lot about it with the business that we're in now. But um, they fucking tired you out. So you didn't screw off later on. You didn't, you know, you didn't have the energy to go out to, you know, to a bar and, you know, do bad things at, you know, 12 o'clock at night because you're fucking tired. Right. So yeah, you have that aspect of it, but also kind of taught you the value of a dollar. And, um, you know, it was, it was invaluable for the two of us. So people have this obviously, and, and it's understandable why people have the misconception of you guys, right? Like your dad's a, a billionaire long before he became president, he was kind of a, kind of a face of New York, um, real estate money. Right. But because I know you guys well, I know that you didn't have this, this really spoiled, like lifestyle growing up. It's just not how you guys were raised. And I under, so I understand the misconception of it because people saw Donald Trump as a certain, you know, as a billionaire. So they, they would see you guys as billionaires kids. And then just the natural, the the natural perception of that would be okay these were some really spoiled spoiled kids but like i know what you guys do for a living and about kind of what you guys make uh as a salary for working for the company and it is nowhere near what people would think um you know it is it is far more far more everyday i mean i have i i know doctors that that financially bring home more than than you guys do from the Trump organization, right? So it is not like you guys have your own private jets. You're flying to the office in a helicopter. It's just it's not like that. My mom was. You know, we we have grandparents, and and this got us into the love of the outdoors. But our grandparents were from the Czech Republic, and so we went over there every year. And you know, there's nothing. This was effectively communist Czechoslovakia at the at the time, and there's no TVs. There's no screwing off. There's no WWE. You're not. Right. I mean, it was just a very different lifestyle than the lifestyle that young kids here had here in the States. Right. You're not watching the A team. Right. I mean, you went outside, you played with sticks, you went into the woods and you screwed off, you built a little fire, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we saw that growing up. We saw our grandparents who were from a communist country. We were there during communism. You know, and then you come back to, you know, a building that I'm in right now, Trump Tower, where we were living. And all of a sudden you're in this massive apartment overlooking all of New York. Right. I mean, the kind of dichotomy of our lifestyle was 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 massive. We saw the glitz and the glamour and the Mar-a-Lagos on on one side of it. We also saw incredibly poor countries that were you know fighting their way out of you know a massive poverty and, and communism. So we saw the other side of that, and and both sides were kind of ingrained in us. And you know we did have a work ethic. You know it's one thing my parents always wanted. You know you're going to work. Um, you're going to work. You're going to learn. The trades you're going to learn great skills and you're not going to be spoiled brats you're going to you know earn what you know you're going to earn whatever you get yeah and um and frankly you know i say this all the time but if we weren't good at this job if i wasn't good at the real estate stuff believe me i wouldn't be in this company i mean you know ne- neptism only goes so far and uh we've done a great job with the organization we've never had a stronger company um but you know if we weren't good at it believe me we wouldn't be here right and yeah. i i think i had the same misconceptions that you were mentioning before of of others because Listen, I know a lot of those kids. We went to the same schools. Most of those kids got hooked on drugs, drinking, you know, bad, bad, bad hobbies. Um, were getting the Ferraris when they were 16 years old. It just wasn't us. And, and people perceive us to be that way. I just bought a house down in Florida. I did half the electrical work myself, right? Just because I know how to do it. And frankly, I enjoy working with my hands and everything else. But people would otherwise laugh, you know, what Trump's going to do that. You're perfectly capable of hiring a contractor to go do it. You can afford it. You know, we legitimately like it. And it's, um, you know, and, and that obviously translates into our hobbies as well. I mean, you see how into our hobbies we are, whether it's uh, the gun building stuff, the fly tying stuff. I mean, we we like to get we like to get dirty. We like to get ingrained in whatever we're doing and uh, and kind of take it to the next level. Don, Don paints you. Um, you probably don't know this and he probably doesn't want you to know this, but he always paints you in such a favorable light when it comes to your work ethic. Um, he's told me before, like, Eric is the guy that will go on to one of our properties and inspect everything and end up in the basement 
looking at paint chips falling off of the boiler and be like, Hey guys, we need to repaint this boiler. Um, you know, this, this thing is looking old and and we need to get this thing looking right. And he's like, Eric is the one in the basement inspecting boilers. You know, I'll actually walk through the loading dock because guess what? Our, our lobbies always look perfect. Um, how does your loading dock look? Is it, is it spotless? Is it clean? And as I'm walking a project and I know every single room of every single one of our projects, I know, you know, literally every closet, every electrical room, every, boiler room, as you're saying, every HVAC. And, you know, I just spent a lot of time there, but, uh, you know, I will open up doors, open that door, open that door. I mean, those mechanical rooms better be perfect. And, you know, I'm a very anal person. That's why I like some of the hobbies that I do. But but beyond that, again, if, if they know that you care about that little mechanical room that's in the back corner of some basement that no guest will ever see, you better believe they'll be all, all over your lobbies and, you know, your F&B areas and your ballrooms and, and those will be perfect. And so it's just, you know, I, I do it in a certain way to make a point. I also do it because if you have clean electrical rooms and boilers, a lot less bad things happen, right? And yeah. um, you know, it's you you invest in yourself. But um, no, I'm incredibly anal, and uh, I, I think it's kind of you know why we run at the level that we do. A couple of years ago, you and I were on the range, and I was shooting rifles and pistols that you were making. Um, and when I say making, you were you were um, chambering, uh, you know basically setting up chassis rifles. Um, and, and I mean, I guess you could call the pistols almost a chassis pistol, um, using a 700 type action, but we were shooting, I shot one of your pistols out to, it was like 990 yards. It was just shy of a thousand yards. And I was hitting the steel plate every time with a pistol that you made in your basement and you were, don't you have a, a lathe and, and, um, and a mill in your own basement? Yeah. So I, uh, I did a little bit of thousand yard stuff growing up became great friends with a lot of the gunsmiths. And I always loved kind of back to the um, the trades and kind of working on construction sites. I always loved working with my hands. And so, you know, I'd go spend weekends with them and, you know, they'd be betting, you know, 20 rifles. Eric, hey, do you want to help me bed rifles? And so all of a sudden I'm, you know, hands deep betting rifles. And, you know, the next time, hey, you know, I'm uh, putting muzzle brakes on guns. You want to, you know, turn threads for me on a lathe and, you know, got good at doing that and chambering guns and, um, you know, left it for a little while. Obviously, I was in college, I was working couldn't really afford to set up a, a full shop, um, you know, but in the last, uh, the last decade put together a great shop blades, do all my own rifle work, uh, all my own chambering work. I'm, uh, you know, I, back to kind of the anal retentive, right. It's, it's the perfect hobby for somebody who's incredibly anal, right. You're, you're, you're cutting metal to half a thousandth of an inch and you have to get it right. When you head space, you have to get it right. You can't miss, there is no, there is no missing on your measurements. There's no, you know, and the end result is a rifle that, shoots into one hole, right? No different than that XP 500 there, that XP 100 that I built, uh, Don, I think it was a six dash or something I built it in, but you know, we were shooting steel at 1240, 1250 with that gun and, you know, smacking it every single time. I just, I, I love the end result of getting great components, putting them together, good machine work, you know, loads. something that's excellent, that freaking wax steel every single time at long ranges. And, um, I love the rifle building stuff. I mean, I'm a, I'm a rifle fanatic. Um, There's a level of OCD involved with the hand loading. You love playing with wildcat uh, cartridges. Um, And then to take it even further, you're chambering, you're, you're cutting and chambering and building these rifles yourself. So like the, to me, the largest component of OCD type activity is certainly in hand loading. Um, but then when you take it one step further and you're hand loading and making the rifles, to me, it speaks to that, that person that is just like chasing perfection of, of something. Well, you know, um, my problem, it, it, I get bored, right? So if I build a rifle, so say I'm building a, um, some PRS rifle, I get it, I build it. It's beautiful. turns out, you know, I mean, I do everything. I mean, I engrave the barrels. I do everything. I get that gun to shoot through the same hole. I work up kind of 200 rounds, put them in boxes. At that point, I'm bored. I want to go on and I want to build something else. And I want to get that gun tuned and shooting through the same hole. I just, I don't know why I love the accuracy thing so much. I just, you know, I, I love kind of the, again, it's it's that anal kind of retentive part of me, but I just, I love the notion of of taking something from nothing, building it, being able to tune it, getting it to shoot awesome. And, you know, there is nothing better than shooting steel out, you know, out at a mile. I mean, we, we love that. Don loves that. Um, Don, Don has it too, that, that OCD accuracy chasing, 
uh, hand loading. Now he hasn't taken in it, taken it to making his own rifles. Um, but you guys both have that, that same passion of long range shooting, um, hand loading when you have time, uh, in, in chasing this accuracy perfection. So for two brothers to have it, first of all, did you, did Don influence that or did, did you just kind of develop that on your own? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, Don certainly did. I mean, it, it, we started off with literally BB guns and we shot, I mean, the, the greatest Christmas gift in the world, Jason, was a, do you remember those old kind of copperhead milk cartons of BBs? If we got yeah, one of those the, things for, I was using one this weekend. Honestly, I was happier getting one of those than I would today getting a Ferrari, right? It, like that, that brought more joy to us, right? One of those. And then we, we migrated from that to kind of this plain, simple wood stocked, 1022 and Don and I put more rounds to that 1022 in Greenwich, Connecticut, of all places, right? If if they knew you're shooting 22s in Greenwich, you'd probably go to jail now. But you know, we had this buoy. We, we lived on the water. We had this buoy about 200 yards out his window. And in the middle of the winter, when no boats were around, we just shoot at this foam buoy. We take off little chunks of foam. It was hysterical. You know, that's awesome. At the end of the season, it started like this, right? And you know, by the end of winter, it was like a little, you know, it was a little volleyball. Um you know, you'd be aiming six feet high and four feet to the right because the iron sight sucked on the thing. And, you know, we just, we shot and we shot and we shot that gun. And, you know, he really took the hunting stuff to the next level. I mean, Don's a phenomenal hunter. He's a phenomenal bow hunter. He's a, um, he's great with a recurve bow. I mean, he's, he's really great. And I really probably, and, and don't get me wrong, there's no one that likes hunting more than me. There's no one that likes shooting a bow more than me. I, I do a ton of it, but, you know, I probably took, you know, the long range rifle stuff, you know, the, the reloading, obviously the machining, I probably, you know, went a little bit more on that path. And so, um, you know, whereas he's probably more apt to be found out in the field somewhere, you know, I love, I love sitting in my shop. I love geeking out in my shop and, you know, creating something that, uh, you know, that's awesome. So my youngest son, he's six. He, uh, he was in my office at the house this weekend. Um, and that's where I keep his red rider. I actually keep his red rider locked up with the rest of my guns. Um, and I said, he said, can I shoot my BB gun? And I said, sure. And I got it out and handed it to him. And, um, he stepped outside the office door there and was shooting outside in the yard and came back in. He said, I'm out of BBs. And I pulled out one of those cartons you're talking about. And I said, I looked at it and I said, rush, how many BBs do you think are in this carton? And, uh, he said, uh, 200. And I said, there's 6,000 BBs in this carton. And his eyes just lit up. And he he's like, man, that's, you could just tell he was thinking of all the possibilities for 6,000 BBs. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll have that. He'll have that finished by the end of the day. I mean, he's not fair. It's, it's so you mentioned the Red Rider, and that's what we grew up shooting, right? These, these yeah. really rough BB guns. And now what they're producing, I mean, even 22s, like some of the. 22s that my sons will be shooting and my son and daughter will be shooting, you know, on the Rimex actions and custom barrels suppressed yep. with, you know, great optics. And then you, you go back to some of the crap that we grew up shooting that was just rough as hell. And, you know, again, you needed to Kentucky windage everything because the iron sights literally didn't have enough movement in them to actually get to yeah. you know, proper point of aim and everything else. And, you know, somehow we made it work and we had a great time. And I'm just worried about, you know, kind of the next generation of kids, or at least my kids, you know, becoming too spoiled with, you see these FX air guns that are shooting, you know, into the same hole every single time at yeah. 50 yards. And it's, it's a slightly different game than we grew up, you know, big time, the, the, big the, time. The slingshot with the uh, dry rotted band. You're worried about it coming back and whacking you in the face. It's, you know, it just seems like it's a different world today than it, was it is, before. man. So we work with air force air guns and they sent me, um, they sent me a compressor and an air gun, a 25 caliber air gun <laughs> with a suppressed barrel. Um, I have, I think like a 20 X optic on this thing and the boys love to shoot it, but I'm like, look, you know, you need to think of this thing more in terms of a deer rifle because you can actually kill a deer with this 25 caliber air gun. People have done it. So this isn't like shoot towards the neighbor's house or shoot the yeah. street light out with this thing. This is pretty serious. Oh, you're running 4,000 PSI out of a dude. We run, we run this thing. Uh, I think I'm I'm running it at like 2,500 PSI, but it's shooting really fast, really straight. And we shoot, we call them yard grizzlies. We shoot squirrels all the time. And the kids, the kids love it. Uh, and there's a million of them around the house and, and it's just a lot of fun, but the, the, the game has changed since you and I were younger, for sure. 
Well, yeah, um, yeah. So I grew up doing a little bit of thousand yard competition and, you know, various states in Pennsylvania and some other places. And even if you look back to our old rifles that we were shooting, you know, all true to Remington 700s, right? Um, big bowl barrels. You'd have to make the stocks. You know, you'd have these long barrel blocks on them. The optics kind of sucked. No zero stops. You know, typically one inch tubes on the scopes, right? It's, yep. you know, you're shooting pretty standard calibers, a lot of 300 weather bees and stuff like that. Your, your advanced bullets were like a 240 grain match king. Yeah. And, and now all of a sudden you're seeing, you know, the zero compromise come out and the knife forces and the great loopholes. You're seeing all these custom actions, the best barrels you've ever seen, the best bullets you've ever seen, you know, uh, much more consistent powders, custom brass. So many of these companies are coming out with custom brass. I mean, stuff's like jewelry, right? You're not... Yeah sitting there weighing and sorting. It's all, I, think it's the, I think it's the digital influence on this stuff, like actually having um, machines and and not doing everything manually anymore um, oh. to where they can, they can take measurements uh, at 500 spots on an action as they're turning oh. these actions out. You know, it's everything has just become so much more precise when you hook a computer up to a machine and you start cutting. I mean, you can get so much more precise than you could if you were just running it on a, a on your own machine. I mean, even even think about it, as much of the gunsmithing as I do right now, you know how easy it is to go out and get a prefit barrel for just about any custom action. You yeah. know, I can have that on the gun and be shooting in exactly three and a half minutes. It's, yeah. And by it's, the way, these custom barrels are coming off of, you know, uh, the greatest CNC machines that are cutting to ten thousandth of an inch every single time. You can turn out seven barrels to the exact same spec. It's it's really amazing stuff, right? It's, it's very very different. Some than, really cool advancement, yeah. um, the, the, and and it all occurred in our lifetime. Oh, so, yeah. And by the way, it's, when I've gotten to watch it, it's still going crazy. Look at the, the, the guys who are shooting king of two miles now and the reliability, you know, and, and I mean, the targets that these guys are hitting at the distances that they're they're shooting them is just incredible. You know? So who's who's a better shooter? You or Don? Of course, me. Think I'm going to give that to Don on the range on the range. You outshoot Don. 100 percent. Absolutely. 100 percent. All right. We'll see. He'll give you the opposite answer, but we'll we'll, we'll do a little shoot off one of these days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you are spending. Where do you spend most of your time these days? Yeah, so I'm I'm Florida based. Um, spend a little bit of time in New York still. Obviously, we have a, a bunch of assets in in New York, so I run the company. Uh, so I'm kind of back and forth between the two, and I'm all over the world. And but I love Florida. I mean, as as soon as I uh, as soon as I left New York, I called it uh, escaping communism. Yep, it just went to shit, and it's it's a shame because New York is New York's a great state, right? Everybody thinks about the city. Just cut off the city for a second. Just talk about. The Catskills and the Adirondacks, some of the best hunting, some of the best fishing, uh, some of the best waterfowl, you know, anywhere in the world. I mean, one of the most beautiful states in the world. You know, people- I, I've always said it's it's a sleeper state for sportsmen. You've got you've got such a range from like Montauk and offshore fishing and and sea duck hunting out that way up to like the Catskills, like you were talking about, and and the Adirondacks. I mean, there's such diversity in the state of New York for somebody who likes to do what you and I like to do. And most people, it's not even on their radar to hunt New York or oh, fish New the York. The best hunting, and people are going to laugh, but striped bass fishing, hunting, go right off literally the end of the runways at, at JFK Airport. It's unbelievable. I mean, you go out to the Hamptons. And I know this is crazy because some, you know, one of the wealthiest areas probably in the world, the the goose hunting out there during the winter when no one's out there. Because why would anybody be in the Hamptons in the middle of winter, right? Or at least people who are out there. The goose hunting is my favorite time by far to go out there. It's unbelievable. The waterfowl. I duck hunted, I duck hunted in a field next to the Abercrombie Mansion in the Hamptons and had a just a burner dove, uh, duck hunt there. Unbelievable. It's yeah. literally right on the eastern, you know, flyways. And it's, uh, now, New York is uh, is an amazing state. They've screwed it up um, with politics, as you know. You know, they've um, let kind of crime go rampant and, you know, forced a lot of people out of the state, including me, and went down to Florida and have, have never been happier. But, uh, you know, still love what New York stands for. Love what New York is. Just hate the direction that they've taken the state. I mean, they've really kind of turned it to shit, unfortunately. Are you, by nature, like a really political person? Not really, to tell you the truth. I mean, I I, I care tremendously. Um, believe me, if if you're going to stand on that stage, you better you better care, Jason. Right? It's you know. And and by the way, the you know the members of our family have taken more arrows than probably any human beings ever. Right? It's you stand on that stage. They were coming after you, and they started day one. I mean, I remember about you know five minutes after Hillary called my father. I can see it. I was literally saying right there. You know, about five minutes later, the Washington Post does an article saying this is the day that impeachment of Donald Trump begins. Right. They never even gave the guy a chance. It's 
five minutes after Hillary calls to concede the race in 2016, they're talking about how they're going to start impeaching him. And, you know, and, yeah. and they did. And, you know, it's a it's a dirty system. It's a it's a gross system. Unfortunately, uh, they weaponize every aspect of government. You know, they weaponize. They tried to go after him when he was in the executive branch. But fortunately, constitutionally, you have some protections. Uh, and if they can't get you there, believe me, they go after you civilly. And, you know, I, I mean, we've we've dealt with that um, kind of time and time again. And it's uh, it's gross. And, you know, there are unequal scales of justice in this country. We see that every single day. If I smoke crack and I was having sex with hookers and I was doing all the things that Hunter Biden was doing, I'd be in jail for the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, if my wife ever threw a pistol, a loaded pistol in a garbage can of a supermarket next to the school or whatever the hell the incident was, right, that that's reported everywhere. You don't think I'd be in jail for that? You don't think she'd be in jail for that? If I relied on a 4470, you don't think I'd be in jail for doing so? Of course I would, right? So you have equal. So it's not that I'm actually a political person. I I care tremendously about this country. Um, you see a country that is massively in decline because of you know pure incompetence. Um, you look at Joe Biden. I don't think the guy works. He certainly doesn't work. I don't think he's competent. Uh, I don't think he cares. You know, and uh, it's it's sad because we we had a great trajectory going, and you know, there's nothing in the world I like more than kind of red, white, and blue, um, and it's being tossed away, unfortunately. And, and and by the way, not just it's not just being tossed away. It's all the things that you and I care about too are being tossed away, right? Um, the or assault attacked, on, yeah. The assault on the Second Amendment. You know, I don't know. I've got a lot of guns. Not not a single one of my guns has ever hurt somebody. Um, yeah. In fact, I know a lot of people. There's, you know, you, you walk through. You know, uh, you you walk through Safari Club, you walk through NRA, you walk through any of these shows. You got some of the greatest Americans in the world that are at these shows who wouldn't hurt a fly, uh, who are just the the greatest and best people, but yet they're villainized and demonized um, for no reason whatsoever. And and so, uh, you know, I believe that standing on that stage, I believe that running the company, obviously, while my father was in office, you know, it allowed him to actually kind of take on the office. I care deeply about the movement. I care deeply about, um, you know, saving our, our nation from ruin and protecting the things that we all care about. And uh, and so it's 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 not that I'd ever want to sit in that seat myself, um, but I will fight damn hard for it because it's it's just about everything that makes up my DNA and my soul. When you and I hang out, or Don and I hang out, the conversations are rarely political. It's always more about like you know shooting, hunting, fishing, goofing off, whatever. And that's, you know, I wanted field ethos to not be political. Um, I wanted it to be to, to weigh in on the issues that matter to sportsmen and, and hunters and shooters and things like that. But I just feel like more and more people need a fucking break from politics. And but but personally, I also had become more involved in political conversations just for the same things that you've said is like, things are just headed in the wrong direction. And so you can't just bury your head in the sand. Now, as a company, I wanted this, this to be an entertainment and, and place that people go to, you know, consume things that they enjoy and to take a break from some of those other things. But personally, I'm, I'm more and more having conversations that I, that I wouldn't have had 10 years ago, just because I don't think we can afford not to, but um, yeah, I mean, I, not right. And, and by the way, believe me, there's nothing I'd like to do more than step out of a political sphere because you know it, it's it's all encompassing. But you know, look at what they're trying to do to the sport fishermen right now off of you know the entire East Coast, where you know you, you own a Viking, you can't go more than ten knots. Now these guys are running out to the canyons; they have to run 120, 130 miles out to go fishing, right? But now they want to put in legislation that you can't go more than ten knots. You know, at any point until you get way past the canyons, congratulations. It takes you, you know, 20 hours to get out to go fishing from, you know, any of the any of the states on the kind of northern east coast. Yeah. You know, look at obviously the assault on guns, you know, in this country. Look at the assault on um, you know, public lands that are existing in the country. I mean, you know, the problem is the two are part and parcel of each other, right? Take take every social issue, throw, you know, throw it away just for a second. I mean, if you actually look at the issues. So many of the issues out there will actually devastate the things that we love, you know, hunting, fishing, you know, 2A, the shooting sports, uh, so on and so forth. I mean, they're not making any more public ranges. They're trying to demonize them. They're trying to uh, shut down FFLs. They're trying to, I mean, you know, go through the list and, and you know, indirectly, those policies actually kill the very things we love. Yeah. I mean, our way of life and the way of life for a lot of Americans and, and um, 
in sportsmen is just flat out under attack. Uh, and that's just the reality of it. And so unfortunately we can't, we can't neglect all the political side of that because field ethos won't exist in a decade. If you do, we don't, we don't have these conversations and people don't, don't get behind some of these causes, but, um, so what are we going right. to start ragging on Don? Do that's, that's, that's where I was headed right now. Um, so I was supposed to be on a trip with Don right now, uh, out of the country. I won't say where he is, although this podcast will air once he's already back. Um, but he and Donnie and Knox Cronenberg are on a hunting trip and I was supposed to go, but I just had too much, too much travel already this year. Um, and Donnie, by the way, I'm like, I somehow had become Donnie's punching bag. Um, you know, the kid is just, you know, at that age, that 14 year old age, he's just, he's just kind of rutting around and, and, always screwing with whoever's standing next to him. But for whatever reason, he loves to screw with me. So he sent me a message. I guess Don told him I wasn't going like the night before they were leaving. And so Donnie started texting me and he's like, why aren't you going? And I said, man, I've, I've just been gone from home too much. He's like, I don't care. Um, you know, Knox is going to replace you anyways. And just, just shit talking. But uh, anyways, I was supposed to be on this hunt with Don and, um, Don sends me this message yesterday. Um, and it was it was this cool picture. I'm not gonna not even gonna discuss it till he gets back. But he, it's total bullshit. This this photo that he sent me, and I said uh, I said that's that's bullshit. And he just goes, "Well, I'll let you make up your own mind." He didn't confirm. He didn't deny. He's just kind of trolling me to to bite on this really cool picture because I wasn't on the trip. Um, but you know, Don Don makes it makes it really fun to screw with him. Right. Because he he's he's so type A. Um, he's such a perfectionist um, that when any time I can find an opportunity to seize on Don and and make fun of him, I'm I'm right there. And I've noticed that you do the same. So you and I started sharing uh, photos back and forth, funny photos of Don. You're the one that gave me the Don and the Dolphin right. um, photo. And, and you've sent me a couple other ones. But Anytime I'm pissed off, I, I think of Don Leary making out. I mean, he's got his like lips on top of the little bill of the dolphin. It's uh, fantastic stuff. It is one of the. It is. It, you gotta make a T-shirt out of that one. I mean, you don't think of these these pictures coming back to haunt you um, when you're in your 40s, but we've we've got this. We've got all the ammo in the world to screw with Don um, in your catalog of images. But um, you know, you grew up with him as the little brother, and. Uh, and so, and then you, you turned up to be, you turned out to be a lot bigger than him. Um, so, you know, let's just say right now you and Don have an argument. He slaps you in the face. Are you getting ready to win a fight? Is that how you see it? He's slapping. Yes. Now, honestly, I think it, the problem is Don was, as I mentioned before, six years older, right? So yeah. his fighting record against me was like 6,730 to zero because you just yeah. can't make up that age. Then at like, you know, 25 he retires right when i'm bigger than him and you know could put up a fight he he retires so like i don't really have that opportunity anymore to go after him but he's um now don's listen don's the greatest i mean he cares more about these sports than than anybody i've ever met i mean he truly is is deeply deeply passionate um you know he he loves it but he's easy to shit on he makes it fun so much of it actually comes out of his real passion for it so i'll never forget i was, I was sitting in my office right here and this was, you know, three years ago. I had Secret Service comes literally running into my office. They fly around the door. They go, Eric, Eric, we need to talk to you. I go, guys, come down. What the hell is going on? They go, your brother has lost his freaking mind. I go, well, that's that's usual, Don. And I go, what what's he doing? What do you need me to solve, sir? He's going to Turkmenistan. And I go, Turkmenistan. What the hell is he doing in Turkmenistan? Well, he wants to go hunt sheep. And I go. He does know where that country is located, right? Like like two miles, like on the northern border of Iran. Now, about three days before my father had killed Soleimani, right? He shot the drone and you know outside in Iraq, killed Soleimani. They were not exactly big fans, and still to this day are not exactly big fans of the Trump family. And they go, We cannot go to Turkmenistan. It is right next to Afghanistan, it's right next to Iran. This is gonna so I go, guys, I'll take care of this. So I go into Don's office, I go, Don. You realize you really can't go to Turkmenistan. Like, like this is a this is a joke. You're screwing with Sacred Service. No, 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 I'm going there. We're gonna keep a very, very low profile. Not, not a big deal. We're gonna go chase, chase sheep for about two weeks. I go done. This is fucking insane. They literally 
you just took out their top. We just took out their top general over there. Like you can't, you can't show up to Turkmenistan. You're not going to make it out alive. Are you? Are you, you can't out recreate where you just cut somebody's head off, or where, where they want to cut your head off? He goes, no, no, we're going to be super quiet. I'm like, your father is the commander in chief of the United States of America. Like, how quiet do you think you're going to be going into Turkmenistan with with, with guys in suits? Like, you can't do it. And the, the reason I tell that story is a, it's funny as hell, but b, it just shows his true love for for adventure and and outdoors and. You know, we've we've done a, a bunch of trips up to Alaska, up to you know Northwest Territories, caribou, mountain caribou, sheep. Um, you know, sleeping on a on a mountain, you know, above tree line, no fires, no anything for a week, being you know rained on and sleeted on and, and snowed on, and you know you're wet the entire time. And uh, in a certain way, it's miserable, but it's also the most fun thing you can do. And you know, uh, I'll never forget. You know, four or five, six days. You know, I'm like, all right, I'm ready to get out of here. This is great. You know, it's been a fun trip. You know, you've got blisters all over your feet. You've been wet for, you know, six days. It's going to be great to go get a burger and a shower. You know, and Don's just in it to keep going. I mean, he he just, you know, leave him there for another 10 days. Leave him there for another 14 days. The guy's perfectly happy. I mean, he's a guy who, uh, you know, I have in my DNA, but Don is just a different, he's a different creature. He 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 loves his shit and he, he lives for the stuff and he lives for that adventure. And, you know, whether it's Mongolia, whether it's Africa, whether it's, um, you know, kind of the, the nastiest mountain and you know in the arctic you know don don will be there and he uh you know he loves it he really does live for this stuff he loves it um so he and i were in uh mongolia last year and um they they grossly downplayed the uh trek across the desert that we were gonna have to make and in, in these vehicles they told us we had like a four hour ride and i think it was 18 hours later we pulled into camp and we're at one point we were pushing a minivan across a, a flooded out uh riverbed. Um, and Don and I were just exhausted when we got there. But I somehow still woke up early the next morning, right as the sun was coming up. And so I got out. Don and I and Donnie were sharing a yurt. And so I I walked out to this um to the top of this ridge and was just watching the sun come up. And I turn around and I see Don walking out towards me. Uh he, he was halfway between me and the yurt. And he was wearing boxers, a T-shirt and white Crocs, uh, just kind of walking across this field. And um, and so I, I love making fun of Don's style, um, you know, when he's when he's hunting or whatever. Like, first of all, he doesn't care about style. He's just like, whatever, I'll put a suit on if I have to put a suit on for something. Uh, I think Kim probably dresses him uh, before he makes any public appearance. But you know, Don's preferred Don's preferred outfit is a t-shirt, something covering his dick, and then a pair of Crocs. Um, and, and by the way, long socks. I don't know what it is. First of all, Don, you will never see Don in shorts. He never wears shorts. Never. Like, it's like a remarkable thing. He lives in Florida and the guy never wears shorts. But he also, the only times you will see him in shorts if he's working out, but he'll have socks up to his knees. I go, Don, what is it with... For Christmas, can I buy you a pair of ankle socks? Like you just one pair of ankle socks. <laughs> You'll have these white socks with always these funny colored sneakers. I don't know what it is. You know, it's he's the greatest. Let me ask you this. Um, I've been breaking his balls on this with his rumble show. I was on his rumble show the other night. And is it's Don and your dad. They're always doing this with their hands while they're talking. I notice you don't ever do it. Like, what is the, what is it with the Trumpy hands? I don't know. I, I see it a lot. I, I'm not sure if I ever picked up uh, until I saw the his show. And he likes doing that. He likes to start off very animated. He does a lot of a lot of this motion, right? Yep. Yeah. He loves he lo- he loves the talky hands. I actually think he's more animated with his hands than my father's. No, he is. He is. But your dad's your dad is big time animated. Don is super animated. And when he gets excited about stuff, it gets even more, you know, he's, yeah, it goes crazy, you know, making all these, these gestures and 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 he gets loud. It gets loud. Um, That's that's a joke in our family. You know, like, you know, the dinner table, it's like, Don, can you take it down three notches? Not that we're all not incredibly alpha type A loud people. I'm not sure if anybody's ever called any Trump not loud, but he's uh no, it's but he he really is a, he's the greatest and he does it out of passion, right? It's a hell of a lot better than sitting there being somber as hell. And- no, he's way into it. Like he 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 gets way into this stuff and to me that's what makes it fun is that he's like really into what he's talking about. Um but 
I, I, I don't know. I, for whatever reason, that one thing I have just been hammering him on lately. And he, right. here's the thing too. You criticize Don for something and he could not care less. Um, you know, he's, he, he takes criticism very, very well. Um, because he just doesn't care. He's like, he just is like, well, I'm going to do me, you know, whatever, say whatever you want. Um, but, and you guys, I, I think that's, that's part of a, that's that we share that, right? Like make fun of us. We don't care. We're comfortable in who we are. Um, you know, and, and to see, to, I mean, it's not just your dad. Don has been attacked a lot. Um, one, because he puts himself out there. He, he, he puts himself out there on camera a lot more than most people do. So he opens the door for a lot of criticism, but he really doesn't care about personal criticism against him. He gets passionate when when something is affecting other groups of people that he's passionate about. But personal attacks on Don, like he does not lose sleep over that kind of stuff. Jason, if, if you took the attacks that we've taken over the last six years personally, you'd be in a mental institution. You'd be a basket case, right? You, you just yeah. can't do it. I mean, and, and by the way, you know what I've always noticed? I was a guy that Saturday Night Live had on, you know, with a little fidget spinner screwing around, right? I mean, they went after me viciously. And then they do. They call you every name in the book. They they label you as things that you're clearly not. Uh, you know, this is all part of their game. You know, and they'll spend millions and millions of dollars doing that. And they have an entire left wing media who will, you know, kind of perpetrate lies and other things. If you literally let those things bother you, you couldn't survive. You'd be you'd be dead. You have to drown them out. But you also have to remember that the more they attack you, typically the better you're doing. Right? They don't they don't focus their guns on the people who aren't effective. And so. You know, when when Don and I were out there on campaign trail every single day for, you know, 200 days doing six, seven, eight events, you know, speeches every single day going town to town to town in 13 swing states. And, you know, we're drawing crowds of 1500 people per place when, you know, you know, Biden's across the way or Hillary's across the way. They can't bring anybody into a room, you know, and all of a sudden you see those attacks start ramping up, you know, go figure. You just did something right. You're getting you're getting to them and they're trying to otherwise you know, diminish your value, diminish your capital. Um, so you actually almost have to take it as a badge of honor. I know it's kind of hard to look at it like that, but again, if they don't care about you, if you're not effective, they're not going to waste the energy on you. That's exactly right. And so Don and I have been in some pretty miserable situations, hunting and and being outdoors. And he is the type, and I've, I've told people this before, and they probably discount it, but if if I was going to find myself in a pretty gnarly situation in the back country or, or somewhere where help was days away and I had to pick a group of people to share that experience with, to, to come through it successfully. Don, Don is on a short list of people that I would have with me because the dude is, he is going to keep moving forward. He's going to keep moving forward. And if, and if you need help, he's going to stop and help you and he's going to keep you moving forward. Right. So you know, somebody the world's best gear. So you can just steal his jacket and his. You can shit. steal his gear, but he he does not take good care of his gear. I mean, he he shows up on hunts and he's literally like shaking dirt off of his stuff before he puts it on. He's just he's rough on his gear, but he's going to keep you moving forward. He can, and that's what people don't realize about you guys, is that your family somehow has the ability to embrace the suck um, more than way more than a normal person. We did a great trip up to uh, to Arctic Red, Northwest Territories, um, after Caribou, and this is some of the roughest country in the world. I mean, you you fly effectively as far north as a plane will will take you, and then you hop on seaplane, go another three hours north, and I mean, you're in the middle of absolutely nowhere. You know, they give you all summer to walk out of there. You couldn't, right? You're just so, you know, you're so deep into the Arctic, and you know, no trees again above tree line. You're, uh, you know, no way to really make a fire. You're, you're cold. You're miserable. You're being rained on and slated on and everything else. And, you know, you're walking 15 miles a day up the nasty stuff, your legs ache, it sucks. And those are always the trees, the embrace the suck, as you said before. I mean, th those are always the the trips that are the most memorable. You know, you're almost there at the time. You're miserable, you're kind of hungry, you're, you're, you're cold. Um, but it's really those adventures that, that you remember. You don't really remember the nice cushy you know, it's 75 degrees. I'm in the middle of Florida and we're going to go chase pigs around the places. It's not, you know, the, the tougher the situation, it, it seems like the more um, the more fun it, it becomes, the, the more fun it actually lives out in your head. Right. It might suck yeah. at the time, but it's 
the better the memory. Of the best memories, you know, some of the yeah. battles we've been through outside of kind of hunting and fishing, you know, those battles suck. You know, Russia, they said we colluded with the Russians, right? It was the biggest you know, farce in the history of the world. We didn't, you know, we went through these these battles and they were nasty and they they were mean. I actually think, you know, that suck, you know, built a lot of character in a certain way. It taught you a lot about who you are as a person. Um, it's rare to find a dad and two sons that are so comfortable moving forward when things suck, right? And And there are a lot of people... And you guys weren't a political family. You know, you guys didn't weren't raised with a political father. Um, and and to but you guys found your way there out of a passion for the country. But at the same time, one thing that's different about you guys is that you love the non-cushy side of things and are very happy when things suck. You can you can still find you, you you still find your path forward and you, you don't get distracted and you just keep moving forward. And I think that's one rare thing that, that we had with your dad as president and with you guys as, as his sons and a support structure was like three, three prominent faces that people were attacking all the time are also three people that, that are very comfortable being attacked and, um, and comfortable being comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and it's just different. It's it's different. I think it's it's one of the reasons that um, I feel like we had such success uh, during that presidency was that um, you know at most your dad was making comments on Twitter or sound bites for um, you know big big media to seize on, but he wasn't. He can make a comment like that, but the reality of it is, is he wasn't distracted. He was just he was just throwing a jab and moving forward. Um, it's hard to effectuate change in the world if you're not willing to make waves, right? You yep. know, they very quiet, very passive. Let's get along with everybody. It, you know, it's 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 a very it's tough to effectuate real change. And you know, I, I think I think there is an adventure. I think there's a, a thrill um, with being um, uncomfortable. I think being uncomfortable hardens you up, which actually makes you probably more likely to take on something like the presidency or Right. You, you, you need to you need to be primed for that. And, you know, otherwise, again, you won't survive. I mean, I look at some of the candidates that are again, I'm not trying to make this political, but I look at some of the candidates that are jumping in and I go, these guys won't last a, a second in that sphere um, because the way that, you know, they're going to go after them, their families, um, they're going to make their lives so miserable. Um, and they probably don't have the let's be very uncomfortable in their DNA. Um, they certainly don't have the financial resources to, to, to fight the bullshit off, right? All the, all the crap that we've had thrown at us, hundreds of millions of dollars of legal fees and other things that we've come out of our own pocket, you know, to pay for um, based on shams and other things, right? So they don't have that resource, but I, I don't know if they could take it from a, a comfortable standpoint. And, and just remember one thing, I mean, as it pertains to politics, I, I think that was part of the, the plan the entire time, which is you take a billionaire, you make their life so uncomfortable that at the end of it, they say, screw it, this, this isn't work it, you know, worth it. I'll go back to Mar-a-Lago, I'll play golf, I'll have a great time, I'll you know, enjoy my family. You know, he's kind of the epitome of the, you know, the American dream. Let's just make him so miserable. Let's make him so uncomfortable. Let's you know, elevate the suck, as you like to say, so much you know, that no one else would do this outside kind of the political sphere, which we can already control. And Make no mistake, Jason. That was that's a big part of their um, their game plan. Now, again, then you talk about our genetics, which I think we're just predisposed to, you know, picking fights, liking fights, being comfortable um, in fights, even even as much as you know as as many of them stink. They probably got the wrong people, but um, I, I do think that uh, you know, kind of that same mentality on the political side definitely translates into okay, let's go sleep on a side of a hill and, and be wet for seven days. And, you know, as miserable as it is, it's actually kind of amazing, right? I'd say the political fights um, follow the same dynamic, just in a, in a very different way. Yeah. All right. Let's switch gears for a second before we wrap this up. Um, so who is more fit, you or your wife? Oh, Laura, 100%. Dude. She's amazing. Um, it, it, I mean, she wins triathlon. She's um you know, nine months pregnant, eight, call it eight months pregnant. She did a, she did a half marathon and, um, you know, I mean, pretty much won the thing, you know, and these are against real competitors. I mean, she's a, she's a maniac. You don't want to do cardio against Laura. She'll, 
she'll ride her bike 40 miles to CrossFit. She'll do two CrossFit. She'll ride her bike back. And um, so she's, so she's physically superior to you. Um, who wins in an argument at the, uh, Eric Trump house? Oh God. Trying to avoid them. <laughs> Trying to avoid them at all costs. <laughs> I'm probably, uh, well, listen, I, I think our mouths kind of keep us alive in, in, in this day and age. So, um, you know, I, I normally don't back down. We're not known for that in our genetics, but, um, you know, she's a, she's a tough cookie too. She's, uh, she's done very, very well on TV, as you know, and, you know, people absolutely adore her. So, um, you know, I, I try not to get on that bad side of her either. Dude, she's the real deal. Um, how many kids do you have? We have two. We have a little boy, Luke, five years old, a little girl, Carolina. Um, they're going to they're gonna be great shooters, so much I can tell you. They they, they love it. So for, for anybody out there trying to get their kids into uh, the shooting sports, go on Amazon. You can buy these dinosaur stickers. It's like six bucks. You get like a thousand of them, right? It's these mean dinosaurs. They go like that. You put them on targets, and the kids love shooting them. My, my kids are they're phenomenally good prone. Um, you know, with air guns with 22s. Um, and, uh, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're certainly loving it. And, uh, you know, ho- hopefully they enjoy that passion as much as I do. So one thing I did with my kids, um, during COVID, I took some baking sheets, like cookie sheets yeah. and hit them in the woods just because they're, they're that thin tin that makes that audible ting sound. And I hit them in the woods. And then uh, after I was done, I went and got them and I was like, Hey guys, we're going on safari today. Um, you know, there's some stuff out there in the woods that I've been seeing and we're going to go, we're going to go target this stuff. And they were, my daughter and my two boys were so amped and we walked through the woods and shot all these cookie sheets. I was like, oh, there's a buffalo and oh, there's a lion, you know, all kinds of stuff. They, I mean, they love that kind of stuff. I'm definitely going to order some dinosaur stickers because they will eat that up, um, especially the boys, but. Cut up your Amazon boxes, put a dinosaur Amazon, sticker yep. on that. And yep. honestly, it's a great way to teach them how to shoot. All right. So I'm bringing my daughter to New York. We're going to come see you this week. Um, If there's one thing in New York City that I've got to take my daughter to do, what is it? The Intrepid. The Intrepid. Yeah, the Intrepid's great. So the Intrepid's a big aircraft carrier, obviously, you know, World War II, uh, got torpedo bombed uh, a bunch of times, was in the Pacific. Uh, But anyway, they brought it into New York probably 20 years ago, maybe even longer, actually definitely longer, probably 30 years ago. They've got the SR-71s on there, the Blackbird. They've got, you know, every fighter, all the, you know, all the F-14s, F-16s, um, F-4s, uh, they have the space shuttle on there. So you can, you can see, I think it's, uh, I forget which one it is off the top of my head now, but you can go literally see the space shuttle. They have all the capsules from the, the Mercury and Gemini missions. Um, awesome, awesome place. Um, a lot of the, the, the World War II, uh, warbirds right next door, they have a submarine. You can go into the submarine. It's, uh, it's awesome. If you like, uh, if you like things that fly, go to the Intrepid. It's, uh, it's a great That's- place. That's similar to, so in Charleston, where I grew up, we have the Yorktown, sure. um, it right there in the, in the Harbor and you can go tour around the Yorktown tour an old world war II submarine. Um, and I, you know, th- that stuff is a full day of exploring on something like that. So that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah the Intrepid. It's, it was my favorite place growing up and they've just, they've made it better and better and better. And it's, uh, it's awesome. Cool. All right. Um, so we're going to see you later this week, dude. I appreciate you doing the podcast. Um, you know, looking forward to seeing you in Florida and picking on Don some more. Um, I still need an Eric Trump rifle or pistol. Um, so don't, don't, uh, don't leave me hanging there. Love it, buddy. All right. Dude, thank you, you so much and and have a good day and, uh, I'll see you in a couple of days. Can't wait. Thanks, man. 